star. Star, special premiere December 14th on Fox. Benjamin Brown, one more time, give what it up. What up, what up? Hey man, thanks for being here. Thanks man, it's nice to follow the uh, Victoria's Secret models. Yeah, I got nothing for you. Sorry, man. Yeah, you weren't. You didn't get to enjoy that. <laughs> I can't you? help you out on that one. You're following Victoria's Secret models right now. Uh, Star Lee Daniels' new show. I got a chance to watch the uh, premiere episode, which is having a preview screening on December 14th, and then coming in January, the show is starting up. It's so cool. It's so Lee Daniels. Uh, can you talk about what that entails, in your opinion? What does the Lee Daniels joint look like to you? Lee Daniels, you gotta, you gotta start with the fact that Lee Daniels is a little bit like Dr. Frankenstein. He's got a bit of the mad scientist uh, to him. He, um, That's a welding all these different pieces and Yeah, genres, you know, yeah. It, and he, he oftentimes throws together elements that you wouldn't necessarily think work. Um, but you know, when I think of Lee and his, and his, and his body of work, he's a provocateur. Mm -hmm. He loves to provoke uh, people in different ways. And he does that, um, I think, by, by uh, illustrating and illuminating worlds that are very familiar to him. And oftentimes it's communities of color where, you know, social ills prevail, whether it's poverty or the, the decrepitude of the foster care system or sexual abuse or, or gun violence. And he, he creates a very real, familiar world. And yet in, it, when, he, when he does it in this show in Star, he balances it out with this um, seemingly ill-fitting um, other element, which is music. But what you discover when you watch the show is that as dramatic and as gritty as the drama is, it's also hopeful and elevated by this, by song. But it's sort of like a glamorous soap opera that's happening at the same time. Yeah, but you know, because people, you know, they're, they're, and naturally so, they're curious about in what ways is Star familiar or uh, comparable to Empire, his other show. Only in that music is sort of the spine of the show. If if Empire is the is the dynasty version, you know, of 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 TV with a, in a hip hop world, Star exists in the world of Precious, his critically acclaimed film from uh, early two thousands. Uh, and true. yet, you combine that with Dreamgirls, which is one of his inspirations. So, and and I think one of the the major differences, at least for me, and I've only seen the pilot of Star, is that Empire takes place sort of after the family has sort of gained all of this success and a lot of the drama comes from the sort of vying for power of what they already have. Whereas with this, a lot of the drama comes for trying to attain that power, trying to get some kind of success within this, this world. I think it's in Atlanta, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, and you know, Lee will be able to speak more articulately to that when he visits here. But I think that both stages in, in whatever, you know, wherever the life is that you meet, whether it's an empire or here, they're reflections of where he was. So. Empire is a reflection of his incredibly, very real, current, fabulous life. He knows everyone. He, uh, if you follow him on Instagram, you know he's one day he's with Oprah, the next day he's with Mariah, and the next day he's palling around with President Obama. So that's that's Lee at the height of his success uh, and all the trappings that come with it, and that's part of the fun in watching Empire and recognizing that. Star, uh, conversely, is really him at the beginning. For me, what really drew me to uh, taking this job on is, among other things that Lee shared with me, was that the character that I play, Jail Rivera, who is a down-on-his-luck uh, uh, former talent manager, is, a, in a very real way, Lee Daniels back in the day, back in the late 90s when he first came to Los Angeles as a manager of actors. He, is that what Lee was when he first went to the... I he didn't was. Know he that. represented, uh, among others, he represented Wes Bentley and Michael Shannon, and a host of other really skilled actors. Uh, but, and this is all part of public record, a lot of his personal demons got in the way of his, his personal and, and professional success, and they derailed him. Eventually, we know Lee corrected himself and, and became who he is. So with Hayil, it's an opportunity to show on some level who he was back then, and, and you know, perhaps illuminate the potential that he has, but you have to take him through that journey of, of hardship first. So talk to me uh, about your character. What, what sort of demons does he have? Um, well, the, the, the essential setup of the show, if, the, if folks out there don't know, is it's the formation of a three-girl R&B group. These three young ladies, uh, full of naivete and ignorance, but just packed full of talent, uh, form a group. They come to Atlanta, the hotbed of the scene, music scene, and they make a go of it. Along the way, they meet this, this manager in a strip club who immediately recognizes their potential 
And um, can I say through a lap dance? Through a lap dance. <laughs> it's Lee Daniels through a lap dance uh, in fire poles and whatnot. Um, he uh, he forms a relationship with them, and he sees it as an opportunity to uh, to ascend again to a place that he knew once. The part of the wedge or part of the dramatic conflict involved is that these young ladies in Atlanta have a godmother in the form of Queen Latifah, who is now a very proper church-going lady, but who upon um, um, you know, discovery, we recognize she was represented by this manager back in the day, and they had hit record. Their success back in the day was derailed by his personal demons. Among them, to your question, cocaine addiction, drinking, um, and other forms of behavior that are certainly questionable for someone who should be leading a group of young ladies. Is he, is, he, is he back on the right track yet? Absolutely not. And for me, that was the, both the appeal and the challenge in taking this role on. Is that you get to play someone who sort of wants to be on the right track but can't really get there? You know, if Lee had come to me and said, uh, this is who this cat is and you know, he's, he's full of issues and full of problems and we don't know where he's gonna end up, he might just emerge as the is the straightforward bad guy, I probably would have said no. But the fact that he emerges as, as Lee down the road, it proves that there's, there's an element of a potential for redemption there, which is something that we all hope for. And we, you know, you'll see almost right off the top that this guy has got very questionable behavior. He's just a pretty slippery guy. Um, well, I would say like Empire as well. I mean, just based off of the pilot, there is no straightforward bad guy. There are right. people who end up doing bad things in it, and at different points, people could become bad guys or, or good guys. That's right. Like Lucius Lyon in Empire is a... I think within one episode, he can be the bad guy and the good guy six different times. Yeah, you know? he shoots his buddy, and then, well, but you root for him anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's odd. Exactly. When, when Lee pitched this uh, pilot to you, to, wanted to bring you on, did he have a script for the pilot already, or is it just sort of an idea for the character, and then he presented you the script when you guys were going to shoot the pilot? He, he very wisely called and broke it down first uh, in terms of what the story was and what he uh, would expect of me in, in being in the pilot, and then he sent me the script. Um, and in that way, there was a bit of hand-holding because, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, when you, and I tease Lee about this, when you as an actor sign on to be part of a Lee Daniels joint, in a way you're turning tricks for him because he is going to pimp you out. If you, look, <laughs> if, if you look at his body of work, whether we're talking about Precious or, um, or The Paper Boy, he gets actors to do things on uh, committed to on camera that they would not do for anyone else, and part of that is because he believes in 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 whatever the story he's telling to such a degree, to such a passionate degree that he convinces you that you're part of something that's actually um, uh, potentially reflective of the of the greater human experience. And so, in a way, you have to give up your self protection. All of us have a level of you know caretaking where we take care of ourselves in a way when you come to play with Lee you have to sort of throw that out the window and trust that he's going to have your back and, and so far so good um, you know the, the, the benefit the payoff in doing so is that he brings you to uh, um, oftentimes to places artistically where you've not been given that chance to go before and there's also an element, I think, of working with Lee Daniels where uh, understanding the tone and his approach to, I think, as we were talking about, pretty risky subject material, not just in terms of nudity or sex or anything like that, but uh, social ills. So if you, as a human being, not as an actor, take something quite seriously, you might be worried if that subject matter gets brought up in a Lee Daniels show because you're not exactly sure how it's gonna be presented to the audience. Is it gonna be presented as something titillating or is it gonna be presented as something that's sort of socially revealing for the audience to learn something from? With Lee Daniels, a lot of times it's a mixture of both at the same time. No, that's a really good point. And, and Lee is very self-aware that way. Uh, he, he recognizes with some of the subject matter that he's going to explore that he is going to be provoking people on some level but also titillating them, but not simply and straightforwardly for exploitation sake. Um, he's going to take you there, turn you on, and then take you somewhere um, existentially or even um, at a minimum just thoughtfully that, that, will, that will force you to consider your own thoughts or ideas about whatever it is he's portraying, whether we're talking about sexual abuse or drug usage or, 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 or gender roles, you know, the politics of gender roles. I mean, he, he, he opens it all up, and he, he does so in a very courageous and unafraid way.
It's a completely uh, different type of performance and work than I think you did earlier this year in, in Doctor Strange, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What is that like for you to go from something like a, a big Marvel movie like that, which is, I mean, I don't even know what that set looked like. The whole movie is just these incredible special effects that I'm imagining are mostly computer graphics versus going on to a sort of Lee Daniels set. Well, we, we shot the pilot for, for Star uh, a year ago this December, and we shot it in Atlanta. And how far are you into the first season of Shadow? We're into the seventh episode of 12, I think, coming out for the season. And it wasn't until... Um, I think it was maybe sometime in May that I got the call for Doctor Strange. And yeah, you would guess that, oh wait, I'm showing up on a, on a massive soundstage that's you know, simply uh, covered by green screen. In fact, it wasn't. I flew to London for a day and we shot under a freeway um, in a place that was meant to look like the Bronx. So the scene that, I, that I, uh, my character, uh, Jonathan Pangborn, is introduced in is on a playground, on a, on a, on a blacktop playing basketball and uh, although he really makes an appearance only in that one scene, he's talked about enough in subsequent scenes uh, that I think audience members after testing were quite curious about his fate uh, to the point where I think the producers and the filmmaker, Scott, um, said, hmm, maybe this is someone we should bring back. So I don't want to spoil anything, but if you haven't seen it, stay all the way to the very end of the credits. There's a teaser there that could indicate um, if in fact this guy might be back. I hope he is. Amazing, That's that's gotta be pretty incredible. I mean, not that you know if he's coming back or not, but I mean, the idea of- I really don't know. No, I, I know, I'm not I'm, trying to- I'm trying to put it out into the universe that yes, in fact, he does come back. Jonathan Pangborn returns with his own with his own sequel, that's his what own, it is. His own movie, <laughs> his own TV series, his own figurines. Yeah, that's it. Everything merchandise. I just want to be on a cereal box. There it is. Uh, what, what, so what was it like getting a call from Marvel, even though it was only uh, a day? You know, uh, similar in, in the top secret nature of things. I mean, Lee is very, you know, you have to sign a waiver before he sends you the material. And, and, and it was an extremely exciting call to get, you know, when they started talking about the possibility of me flying over to London just to do the one scene. You know, when you're talking about a cast like Tilda Swinton, who I've worked with before on a, on a Sony picture called Thumbsucker. Oh, it's a great she, movie. She's one He's of the... He's got another great movie. Sorry. Uh, Mike Mills got another movie. Yeah, 20th out. Century Woman. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. It's, You've it's, seen it already? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Mike's a beautiful man and a, and a really wonderful filmmaker. I can't wait to see that. Um, you know, and then Chiwetel and, and uh, Mads and Ben Wong and Benedict Cumberbatch, of course. Crazy cast. That's kind of new territory for Marvel. I mean, they've always used skilled actors, but this is kind of an internationally skilled cast to be invited to come play with, um, at this point anyway, with, with, with Benedict, and then um, subsequently with Chiwetel was just mind-blowingly cool. I mean, the, f the funny thing is that, you know, I have, a, I have two children. I have a 14-year-old girl and an 11-year-old son, and I long ago lost my cool with them. It just, you know... It's, it, it's sad, too, because, you know, when, when they're five and six years old, like the sun rises and sets on mom and dad, that went away a long time ago. But my son especially, who's now in sixth grade, as soon as he started hearing his friends say, that, hey, your dad's in Doctor Strange, man. That's like my favorite movie of the year. Your dad's kind of cool. All of a sudden, my son is... Came back a little? Yeah, he's, he wants to hang out now, which is... <laughs> And I'll take whatever it takes. I'll but take then, it. But then, is he just like a fan? Is he hanging out with you, and being like, "What's Benedict Wong like? Like, what's no, or no, no, what's he, Benedict Cumberbatch like?" No, he, he's not. He's not quite there. But he, at least he he's trying to take selfies with you. Because he's trying to be, you know, he's trying to be kind of cool about it, as all eleven-year-olds are, are want to be. <laughs> so, you also have a uh, a documentary that's premiering at Sundance. It's been selected. It's premiering at Sundance. Congratulations. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, my thank you. My, my brother Peter and I, along with a, a dear friend, Alpita Patel, formed a, a film company uh, back in 2008 uh, called Five Stick Films. And this is our second film. Our first, La Mission, was uh, in competition at Sundance back in 2008 when, uh, when President Obama was inaugurated. And uh, this documentary is called Dolores, and it's based on the life of Dolores Huerta, who is a living... Uh, a civil rights hero for the Chicano community, Mexican-American community, was a co-founder of the UFW, the United Farm Workers Union, alongside of Cesar Chavez. And the movie is an exploration of her contributions and how those contributions to American history truly uh, 
have on some level either been lost or not credited at all. And it's a very timely conversation to have, of course, especially in light of the fact that um, we had a, a very powerful woman who was this close to being elected president and for whatever reason was not. Um, for whatever reason. For okay. whatever reason was not. Um, so we're very excited about that. You know, we think the subject matter is timely uh, given uh, the current state of the world. And we're very excited about the premiere that happens on, uh, I believe it's uh, inauguration day, January 21st at 3 p.m. at Sundance. That's unbelievable. What's it like for you to, premiering a film like this about Mexican American history, about, about unions, about labor organizers on the same day uh, that a president is being inaugurated that he is, has spoken, to put it mildly, bluntly about Mexican Americans as well as a sort of Congress. And Shamefully about Shamefully, Mexican Americans. Yeah. Uh, um, and as well about, about union organizing as, as well. It, uh, I, I, you know, I would want to say it's surreal, but it's, uh, it's not surreal. It's, it's all too real in, in a very frightening way. But look, we are where we are. We don't know what awaits us as a country. Um, I know a lot of people are, are scared. A lot of people from my community are, are very nervous about uh, the fate of, of many of our family members. Uh, but at the end of the day, man, we got to have faith and hope in our, in our community. Yeah, and, I'm, and I mean our, our greater community. That means all of us as Americans in, in ultimately deciding collectively to do the right thing. Whatever that is, that, you know, that remains to be seen. But uh, we're in the circumstances that we're in, and, and we have to sort of you know, keep forging ahead with, with hope and, and, and pluck. I think one of the things that does that and one of the right things is, is, is making art that celebrates uh, people who impacted history before us and who could potentially impact history afterwards. So congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Who has questions out here? Hello. I just wanted to know, has Lee Daniels made you personally do anything out of your comfort zone during the filming of Star? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What he said. Did was, Lee has... Daniels make you do anything out of your comfort zone? <laughs> um, so... Y it's probably been teased in the trailer, but the, when, when my character, character Jail Rivera, first meets Star, it's in a strip club, and it's by way of a lap dance. Uh, so that's not the most comfortable way to you know, have a first scene with, a, with one of your co-stars, but it's a way to go. Was that the first day you met her? Uh, close to, yeah. <laughs> how do you... How do just, you... just think of gold spandex, and you know, one of her lines in the show is, do I have a camel toe? It's, you know, it's full on. How do, you, uh, how do you get comfortable? How do you make that comfortable for the both of you? You know, for me, uh, you know, part of the comfortability comes in, in fully embracing who the person is and recognizing that he's so completely different than myself. You know, I'm, I'm, at the end of the day, I know what I am. I'm a family man. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with and devoted to my wife and my children. That, those, are the, those are the most important people to me in the world, and the most important thing to me in the world, beyond work even. And so um, when it comes to, to taking on a role like this, I just got to go for it. And I actually, I forewarn my co-stars, if I'm playing as someone who's coked out and drinking, I'm going to be in it. So whatever I do, you know, I hope I don't get slapped, but I'm going to be playing it, just like I did in a movie called Pinero. Actually, it's a movie that I did uh, back in 2000, and it's the film on which I met my wife. Uh, where I was playing a heroin cocaine junkie, the poet playwright Miguel Pinero, who wrote Short Eyes, who enjoyed fame here in New York at the oh, New York Short Eyes, Cafe. The, the play, yeah, yeah. That's right. And, uh, you know, so that film took me artistically to uh, beyond boundaries I had ever thought I would even confront. So this is on some level a little bit like, you know, a reprisal, but it's also, a, 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 you know, a, an R-rated version of that because it's television at the end of the day. So... I just get in it and I try to enjoy it for what it is. Next question. Hey, how's it going? Good. Um, going? I just want to know how much influence did Fox have? Like, because I know sometimes when networks get involved, you know, sometimes it could be good and sometimes it could be bad. So I want to know what was your experience? I had uh, zero dealings with Fox. I mean, the thing, the thing, the thing in with working with Lee and especially in 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 view of the, the massive success he's had with Fox, I would guess that he's had carte blanche to essentially create whatever he wants. Um, I tease him, I say, yeah, you're minting money for Fox right now, so I'm not gonna be surprised if they say yes to everything you wanna do. 
But they also, you know, that's, I'm joking, but part of it is he has now a very real track record with them that, that proves that he can not only be the provocative artist that he is, but he can make them money. And at the end of the day, you know, art is art, but it is also commerce. You know, someone's putting up a, a, a huge amount of money to make sure this thing works. And that's a, that, that requires a certain, a very deep level of trust, really, of, of the artist at the helm of it, and that's Lee. And he's earned it. So they've been very cool in terms of, you know, allowing us to do whatever we need to do to make it real. I'd imagine the, in the involvement of Fox in this were the lawyers being like, you can't really put that on screen, sorry. Maybe not that, but maybe a version of this. You, well, know? you know, it's funny, the, the, one, the one hiccup I have encountered now that, it, that comes to mind is, is my character at times speaks Spanish. And, uh, you know, whoever in the writing room is writing the Spanish, they probably get it off of Google translation. And so I'm throwing in whatever swear words or whatever that I, I learn or what I know. And so standards and practices have come back and like joder is like uh, is can I swear? Yeah. Joder is is it, it either means you know uh, I'm screwed like or or fuck. And so in certain countries it, it's different. So I've been corrected on I have to like say something different. So we had to go into the looping stage and change it up. <laughs> That's the one thing. That's the one thing. So it's language. Uh, I think we have time for one more question right here. How's it going, man? What's going on? How are you? So I was watching the trailer, and one thing that stuck out to me was I saw Tyrese in, like, a pastor uniform, and then I went online to see that he's, like, this ex-convict turned pastor. I was wondering if you can talk about his character and the arc that he goes through in the season. I, I haven't had the opportunity to work with Tyrese, but we've hung out on the set. What a, he's such a cool guy. I mean, the, the funny thing about working with Lee is he populates his set with with these massive artists that have just achieved success in all these different realms, like incredible business people um, to start, but to finish just incredibly talented folk. Like Queen Latifah is one of them. I tease her, I call her Midas, because truly anything she touches, it turns to gold. And she's done whatever she's wanted to do as an artist. How can you not respect that? Tyrese is very similar, you know, he's, he's cut albums, he's an actor, uh, you know, uh, of you know, major studio franchise films. He, uh, he's got a, a car making company. It's really amazing. Is that a car making company? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he, he built custom Jeeps. Of, uh, Voltron is a company, and uh, he's, he's a trip, and he's mad cool. And uh, he's actually he's trying to give me a little bit of an education on how to you know, be more media, social media savvy. Because I'll tell you, I'm a dinosaur. I just I can't get into it. So you're fine. You don't need to be more social media savvy. This is as Take social as I'm me. getting. You don't need yeah. to, no one needs to be more social media savvy. But then you know, he also brings on board, he brings on board Lenny Kravitz, and he brings on Naomi Campbell, and we have Gladys Knight showing up in the third episode. And that's the kind of draw. And you know, he gives folks like these opportunities that they won't, you know, who would have ever thought Mariah Carey would be in Precious? She disappears in Precious. She's that social worker. I don't know if you remember that. She, yeah. I'm not saying that she's in Star, not yet, but um, you know these these are the kinds of folks that that love and respect him and know that he's going to have their backs when they come play and and so um, that's half the fun. Of who's going to show up this week? So and that's the other element we haven't really touched on. It we talked about the kind of the the urban gritty authenticity of of, of the world that Star exists in, but it's also irreverent. I mean, a lot of the action unfolds in a hair salon that is owned and run by Queen Latifah's character, Carlotta. And it's just like, it, you know, a lot of the scenes play for real, like right out of a movie like Barbershop, where that's, that's the Greek chorus. It's where all the, the neighborhood and, 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 and relationship uh, rumors and gossip happens. And it's just as much fun to watch as it is, as you might imagine, to sit in it and be a participant in it. You get to see in the pilot, uh, without giving too much anything away, like a, a really great scene between you and, and Queen Latifah. Uh, for my money, I think, and you were kind of echoing this, she's one of the most charismatic people. Like the camera just eats her up, whether or not she's rapping, singing, or, or acting, or, or hosting a daytime talk show. What was it like working with her? I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, she's her own planetary system. I mean, she's got real gravitational pull. That's just for real. And uh, part of it has to do with her physical beauty. You know, she's got these amazing high cheekbones and this broad forehead and this amazingly luminous skin. No, I'm not in love with her in that way. I love her in other ways. And my wife has given me permission to do so. But she, she has an equally beautiful soul. And there's just, there's like a, queen is appropriate. There's like a, there's like an inherent 
grace to who she is and a real gravitas that, from an actor's point of view, allows you to kind of uh, relax, be pulled into it, and enjoy. She's a skilled pro. You know, she's been around for a long, long time. And, uh, and so on the days when we, she and I get to work together, it's, it's some of my favorite stuff. She's the type of person where I feel like in between scenes, I'd pull aside and try to pull stories out of her. Just like, you know, what it was like at the beginning when she was rapping and like who she hung out with around that time and just hearing as many stories. I try, but you know, that's part of her allure is that she, you know, she's... Shuts it down? No, she doesn't necessarily shut it down. She, she's just cool, you know, like she's so self-contained that you, you know, you want... You, and I'm not even saying that that's, you know, that's, um, that's studied. I think it's just who she is. Right. She achieved success very early, a very accomplished individual, and there's mystique in it, and I, I respect it. Well, the, show, uh, the show's special preview is on December 14th, right after the season finale of Empire, right? And then it comes in, uh, then the show starts running for real in January. Yeah, and during that interim time between December 14th and January 4th, when the second episode uh, comes back on, it will be available online and on demand on Fox. And the show's so fantastic. It's so Lee Daniels. It's really fun to watch. It's great. Thanks so much for being here. Congratulations. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.